Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love! What depths of peace when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone. Who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross. As Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live, there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth like glorious day 
Up from the grave he rose again And as he stands in victory Sin's curse has lost its grip on me For I am his and he With the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life No fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry To final breath Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. I was going to preach a biographical sketch on, on John Mark. That was my game plan. I wanted to. But as I was driving down here, the Lord kind of just changed my mind on this. And I want to be sensitive to the Lord on this. Sometimes I can be really eager to preach one thing, and then the Lord really wants me to preach something else. But I go headstrong with what I want to preach, and then I mess things up. So I don't want to mess things up. I'm tired of doing that. I've done that in the past. And so I hope and I pray this evening that I'm sensitive to the Lord. So if you would this evening, please turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 23. I typically don't enjoy preaching the same message twice. And so this is one of those sermons that I've preached at my church a few weeks back and then um, at Winton Place. I was at Winton Place this morning, at Winton Place this morning, and maybe the Lord knows that I need it for a third time. Uh, and he knows that I have struggles and problems with pride for sure. So in Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus, I'm so thankful that he was this perfect example of humbleness and humility. I pray, Father, that we'll strive for having a humble spirit. I pray that you'll give us wisdom on how to deal with our prideful attitude. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. This past January, as I mentioned, I was sick, really sick for three weeks with pneumonia. I was out of the, our church. I couldn't go to church for three weeks. Couldn't even think about standing behind the pulpit. It just made me sick. Made me sick not being there. It made me sick thinking that if I went there, I just would fall flat on my face, right? But during that time, God did a work on me, and he showed me some errors in my own life. And so today I'm so thankful that God sent me through that trial so that I could learn a little bit more about me so that I can be a better servant of his. So there are many different genres in the Bible. There's the law, the historical narrative. There's poetry and wisdom. There's the prophecy, the gospels. The gospels are very similar to the historical narrative. There's the epistles and the apocalypse. The genre that I struggle with the most happens to be the wisdom genre, the genre that includes Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Songs of Solomon, which is ironic because this evening we're in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs don't contain so much the promises of God as they do the principles of God. If you really want to know the principles of God, there's probably not a better book in the Bible to go to than the book of Proverbs. One of the reasons I really dislike the book of Proverbs as a whole is 
King Solomon, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, used a number of literary devices to put this book together. And I just didn't want to take the time to get to know the literary devices as a whole. In short, I became the opposite of the man that Paul charged Timothy to be. I didn't want to study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth when it came to Proverbs. Sadly, I would rather have been ashamed than approved. Truth is, I've never preached out of the book of Proverbs. And I've been pastoring for over 10 years. Not good and not healthy. So that's one thing that the Lord showed me. That I need to be a better student of God's word. Study isn't an easy word. It means to endeavor and to be diligent and to give diligence and to work and to labor. It's not like I did in high school where I just studied to pass the test and then forgot the material after the test. It's allowing God's word to be a part and the, and the fabric of your life. And so many of the, of, the, of the proverbs fall within three literary devices all connected with the family of parallelism. There's synthetic parallelism, which means the second line of the proverb enhances the first line. There's synonymous parallelism, which means the second line of the proverb restates the first line in different words, but adding emphasis. And then there's antithetical parallelism, where the second line is opposite of the first line. The text before us this evening is an antithetical parallel text. It's the second line in every way, shape possible is opposite of the first line. There's a reason I want to examine the book of Proverbs, particularly this section here. Because I noticed over the last few years how prevalent pride is in our churches. And how little we diagnose pride in our lives. So let's see three things this evening. First, let's look at pride. Again, a man's pride shall bring him low. Now the word pride itself means to swell up, to be inflated, to be high-minded. I've noticed it usually in examples like this where a person thinks that they have arrived in one category in their life while they dismiss the deficiencies in the other categories in their life. Now the Bible is wrought with many prideful people, especially choice saints of God. Abraham was prideful when he thought he had a better solution to the jam in his life by lying than telling the truth. David was prideful when he thought he didn't have to go out to battle with the other kings. Peter was prideful when he thought he had a better plan than Jesus Christ the Lord, the creator of the universe. And James and John were prideful when they thought it was needful to call down fire from heaven to burn one Samaritan village who rejected Jesus, even though in, in very short order, the entire nation of Israel on a corporate level would reject Jesus. Just pride. Pride, 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 pride. Now there are several problems with pride. The first problem with pride we see in our text. A prideful person will trip over their pride. I don't mean to get political, and I, I said this this morning, and I had a brother come after church and said, I believe the election was stolen. Whether you believe the election was stolen or not doesn't change what I'm about to say. I believe President Trump's biggest problem was his pride. He couldn't get out from under his pride. He kept tripping over his pride. The truth is, even though I voted for the man twice, I got President Trump fatigue. Imagine the difference if our leaders were humble. There's a second problem with pride. Not only with the prideful trip over themselves, but in James chapter 4 and verse number 6, there James says, God resisteth the proud. Now it's interesting because when I was in school, I hated grammar. Today, I really love grammar. That word resisteth is a verb, and it's in the present tense, which means whenever pride shows its ugly face, God is there to resist the proud. Yeah, that's right. Third problem with pride. In Proverbs chapter 6, there Solomon employs a mathematical example, usually given to add emphasis to what he's about to say. 
And in this case, he says, there are six things that the Lord hates, yea, seventh is an abomination. Now, whenever a list is given, usually what comes first is the most important. The very first thing that Solomon records that the Lord hates is a proud look. So not only do we trip over a pride, not only does God resist the proud, and not only does God hate the proud, but here's a fourth problem with pride. John, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, he sectionalizes the world system into three categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. See, th this means that we all struggle with pride. We still carry this sinful flesh. I remember what Paul wrote right to Romans. Oh, who shall deliver me from this body of death? It even plagued the great apostle Paul. And so every Christian, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how seasoned you are, no matter how much you know about God's word, or how faithful you've been, or how much you give, or how many people that God has allowed you to lead to, to him, we struggle with pride. Here's the fifth problem. Pride is hard to diagnose. Right? It is. Now, there are some overt cases like politicians, athletes, media people, teachers and their unions who think they know better about how to raise our kids than we do, right? Prideful. But most of the pride that, that, that happens, it's covertly done. It's disguised. Satan is a master manipulator. He's a master deceiver. If Satan can deceive two innocent, sinless people, he can easily deceive us. He's had 6,000 years of history, if not more. When I was battling pneumonia, I had to go to the ER. The VA ER, right? And the VA in Albany is just a fan actually the VA as a whole in Albany and the area is just absolutely fantastic. So I go to the VA ER, they're asking me all sorts of questions. I, I think some of them are stupid. Like, are you struggling with coughing? I'm coughing in front of them, right? Are you wheezing? Can you hear me breathe? Are you taking, you know, short breaths? I don't know, it's, you know, short breaths? But they're asking me all sorts of questions. The purpose of them asking me these questions is to help them interpret the blood work, the chest thrust, x-ray, and eventually the CAT scan. And so this evening, for just a few moments, maybe I'll ask us questions to help kind of diagnose where we are with pride. So the first question to ask is, are you a fault-finding person? Now let me explain what I mean by that in two different ways. The first way, are you the kind of person that finds fault in others, but you struggle with finding fault in yourself? I've been there plenty of times. Yet isn't that where Adam and Eve were when they sinned? Remember when they sinned, they sewed fig leaves together thinking they were covering their nakedness just to find out that when God was on the scene, they weren't covering their nakedness, so they hid themselves. Eventually, they get into a conversation with God. Do you remember what Adam said? Dismissing his fault altogether, he said, Lord, it's the woman that thou gavest me. And it wasn't much better for Eve, right? She, dismissing her own fault, she said, it's the serpent. Yeah. But how often is it, that's our story. Now, a second way about fault finding is when we maximize the faults in others while we minimize our own faults. Yeah. I have a Ph.D. in this. I know this like the back of my hand. I'm perfect at this. Just ask my wife. Arguably the most riveting and provocative sermon ever preached on planet Earth was Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Every aspect of that sermon is provocative and riveting. Probably one of the more provocative statements that Jesus makes occurs in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, and verse number 3, when he says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? And considerest not the beam that is in thy own eye. Now what Jesus isn't saying is that we should never consider the mote that's in our brother's eye. That application would distort this text. 
Instead, Jesus focuses on, before you consult your brother's moat in his eye, make sure you consider the beam that's in your own eye. Now, consider the, the word choice that Jesus used. The word moat is something small. The word beam is something big. In the terminology of Jesus, the sins of others will always be smaller compared to your own sin. And yet, how often do we think the sins of others are greater than our own sin? Remember what the Apostle Paul said when he wrote to Timothy? He said, this is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do you remember what follows? Mm -hmm. Of whom I am chief. Now, I think we would all agree that Paul did some deplorable things right before God saved him. Really deplorable things. But I think we would all agree that he was not the worst wicked the worst, most wicked sinner during his time. Yet in Paul's understanding of sin and grace, he viewed his sin as greater than any other person's sin. So the lesson that Paul, that Jesus gives us in Matthew's Gospel chapter 7 is, before we address the sins of others, first, we need to understand our sins are bigger. And second, we need to deal with our sins first. Imagine how different our tone and our words and our spirit will be when that happens. We will be more readily having the spirit ready to restore a repentant brother or sister than casting stones at them. Second question, do you have a harsh spirit? Does it have to be your way? Now, I'm not talking about biblical truth, right? There is no other way but the right way. But most often, we have harsh spirits over aspects of our life that have nothing to do with God's word. It's our organizational skill set, or it's our pattern, or our philosophy. The Pharisees, right, they had a harsh spirit, didn't they? Especially with their philosophy over the Sabbath day, how oppressive their rules were to the point where the common people couldn't even enjoy the worship of God and the day of rest. Whenever we have a harsh spirit, we ruin, we ruin other people's day. And it's prideful. Third, are you superficial? I think we would all agree that the Corinthians were saved. At least the vast majority of them were saved. They were redeemed. They're brothers and sisters in Christ. They're in heaven today. Yet there was a degree of superficiality within them, right? Paul wrote to this church and said, you should be on the meat of God's word. Instead, you're on the milk of God's word. And what, I dis what I'm just not just discovering today, but what I've noticed over the last few decades is this, is God's people prefer to stay on the milk of God's word, not the meats of God, not, not the meat of God's word. It's as if doctrine is this huge geomet geometric expression that they can never solve. Now, if I had Silas with me, where's Silas? No, Seth with me. Now, you don't know anything about math, right? Seth, where's Seth? Raise your hand, Seth, if, if you're here. Oh, he's there. Oh, yeah. See, if I had Seth with me, he can solve any math equation. But brothers and sisters, doctrine isn't this complex piece of, of, of truth that's impossible for us to understand. We have the Holy Spirit in us that guides us into truth, that helps us to understand these complex layers of doctrine. It is our own laziness that prevents us from studying doctrine. In Acts chapter 2, the very first thing those 3,000 converts did after they were baptized and added to the church was they followed after the apostles' doctrine. In fact, that phrase, continue steadfastly, means that they persevered. It wasn't easy. Their world frame of, of, of looking at the world was constantly being challenged, but they continued steadfastly. How many of us are superficial Christians? Superficial Christians is the result of pride. Fourth, are you presumptive before God? Samson was presumptive before God, right? He just assumed that no matter what degree of wickedness he did, he would always have God's presence and have this enormous strength. 
This is something that the Lord had shared with me during my time with pneumonia. I woke up Monday morning, January the 10th, just not feeling right. Not feeling bad, but not feeling right. I was tired, fatigued. It wasn't just because I preached twice uh, the previous day. Something else was going on. Not sure what it was. One moment I felt good. The other moment I wasn't feeling so good. I missed the men's prayer time that Monday evening. Tuesday I woke up. I was feeling not any better, more fatigued. But this time I had just a slight kind of cold I felt like on, in my chest. Wednesday I woke up and I felt this weight on my chest. And I thought to myself, I even said this to the church as I preached Wednesday, oh, it's just a chest cold. What I'm thinking in the back of my head is this. I am Jeff Brown. I never get sick. This can't be anything serious. And if it's just a chest cold, huh, I can deal with this. I had COVID in December, and I flew through that as if I didn't have anything because I'm Jeff Brown and I don't get sick. I rarely have I ever missed a day of work because I was sick or church because I was sick. So as the week went on, I wasn't getting any better, but I'm Jeff Brown. I don't get sick. Other people may get sick, but not Jeff Brown, right? It's weird talking in the third person. I get it, but that's how I was thinking, and that's how my mind was working. Come Saturday morning, I'm planning to preach Sunday. Even though I'm coughing and I'm not breathing so well. And so my family uh, had this coordinated event where every one of them called me and said, you need to go to the VAER now. And so just to relieve them, I went to the VAER thinking, I just have a chest cold because I'm Jeff Brown and I don't get sick. So after I got there, you know, they did the questions, they did the blood work, they did the chest x-ray, and come to find out I have pneumonia. They gave me some antibiotics. I went back home, and I watched the Cincinnati Bengals beat the Las Vegas Raiders. Who they, by the way? I felt great. Sunday, I felt good. I would have went to church, but I was fearful that my pneumonia was contagious. And I thought, hey, I'm Jeff Brown. I have pneumonia, and it's nothing. And then Sunday night, Everything collapsed around me. Monday, the following Monday, I wasn't doing good. But around Thursday, I started, I, at least I thought I'd turn the corner because I'm Jeff Brown. My genetics have to be pretty awesome. Friday and Saturday, I just, I'm the stalemate, right? Just right there, right? Not doing it, not getting worse, not getting better. I'm planning to preach Sunday morning even though I can't say a sentence without coughing. But somehow, I would manage. I would work my way through it because that's what real men do. And then Saturday night about midnight, I started coughing, had cold chills. I was shaking uncontrollably. By the time it was done five hours later, I could barely even breathe. But I still didn't go to the doctors. Why? Because men like me, we don't go to the hospital twice in the same month. But I did have a regularly scheduled doctor's appointment that Friday. So I thought, I can make it till Friday. Who cares if I'm nearly choking in my own air when I take a hot shower, right? So Thursday I go to get my blood work because that's what I do before I see the doctor. And the doctor calls me even before the appointment and says, listen, you need to go to the VAER right now. Your white blood cell count is double the amount, whatever that is. And so I go there, and they're like, ask the same questions, right? And, and I had the blood work again. And, and this time it took the VA nurse four. My blood oozes out usually, right? They did this arm, this arm, this hand, that hand. And eventually they, they squeezed the blood out of my vein, you know, just to get a few capsules. Like, what's going on? This nurse, actually the nurse had messed up hair, you know, and I just thought, boy, he's going to mess me up, right? And sure enough, if he messed me up, and a lady nurse had to come in to finish the job. Then they did a CAT scan. 
Now, I don't like CAT scans for a couple of reasons. One, because I'm Jeff Brown, and Jeff Brown doesn't need a CAT scan because he has amazing genetics, and he never gets sick. The other reason is it's not a good feeling to have this hot fluid go through your hands and then warm up your own body, right? So the CAT scan revealed that I had a more significant pneumonia than they originally thought. So this time, they're sending me a, a bag full of prescription goodies to go home with, right? Stronger antibiotics, an inhaler. An inhaler? I don't need an inhaler. I don't have asthma. And steroids. I'm trying to lose weight, right? I'm not wanting to blow up. But I felt embarrassed and humiliated. And on my way home, that's when God, his word, the Holy Spirit just pierced me. You are so sick of yourself. Don't you realize the only reason you've had good health, it's because of me? And the reason you have bad health right now, it's because of me. Mm -hmm. So whether you have good health or bad health, give me the glory. Yeah. That was arguably one of the more difficult lessons I've learned in years. Because it took a full three weeks for me to catch what the Lord was doing with me. And so the question is this evening, what kind of pride do you have? Now, the truth is, it's easy to say, we all have pride. The, the preacher just preached, we all have pride. We have this sinful flesh, and the Apostle Paul said, woe is me, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Therefore, we're doomed to exercise pride from time to time. We have no choice, that's our fate. If that's what you're thinking, then you're missing the sermon. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. The Holy Spirit that's in us is greater than pride, than Satan, and even our own sinful flesh. We can conquer pride. Now, to conquer pride, we have to do it God's way. God's not interested in our way. When I was in the military, two years in the Army, four years in the Air Force, when I was in the Army, they, they sang this cadence. And I don't remember the whole cadence, but it goes, the beginning part goes something like this. And you're in the Army, right? Or maybe you're still in the Army, right? Do you do running and cadence and all that? Oh, you're, you're in the Guard, right? They don't, they don't run. Yeah, they're lazy. <laughs> but in the Army, I went back in June of 1987, right? It started with this, mama, mama, can't you see what the army's done to me? The point of the cadence was how, how the army was changing us because mama did a bad job at raising us. There's an army way. If you want to succeed in the army, you have to do it the army's way. Two years ago, I joined the Air Force, and I discovered the same thing. The Air Force doesn't care about mama or the army. They care about their way. And if you want to succeed, then you need to do it their way. And I would say the same thing with us. If we want to succeed in our Christian pilgrimage, then we need to do it God's way. God doesn't care about mama. He doesn't care about papa. He doesn't care about employer. He doesn't care about neighbor. He doesn't care about anyone other than his way. Jesus didn't say it's either my way, the pastor's way, the deacon's way, or the neighbor's way to get to heaven. It's only his way. And so how do we conquer pride? Let me begin with this. First, we need to have a high view of God. We need to have a higher view of God than we do and a lower view of us than we have. In truth, we need to see God in his holiness. What's missing in our churches, I think, one of the elements that's missing in our churches is, is we're not seeing the holiness of God nearly as often as we need to. I mean, consider Job, when he saw the holiness of God. He just, in essence, says, I'm done talking, Lord. You rebuked me. I'm just going to listen now because I'm nothing. Yeah. Isaiah said, woe is me. Even Peter, those few moments that he saw the holiness in Jesus Christ, he would say, depart from me. 
We need to see the holiness of God. We need to yearn for the holiness of God. The Puritans would focus much of their sermons on the holiness of God. There is nothing that's more humbling than to see by faith God's holiness. In fact, in Psalms 89, verse 35, the psalmist says, Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. It is the holiness of God that gives us the high view of God. You cannot appreciate God as a creator without viewing his holiness. You cannot view God's grace without viewing his holiness. You cannot view God's omniscience without viewing his holiness. The holiness of God is more than just an attribute. It permeates through all the attributes of God. Second, we need to be prayerful. Now, I know we pray. And I know Christians pray. And I know that I pray. But I wonder how much of our prayers are biblically based. Isn't it possible to pray and still be self-reliant? Isn't it, pro- isn't it possible to thank God for things and still believing that it was really because of you? Again, in that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus preached on prayer, right? And he said this kind of like midway through. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, what does that mean to you? Here's what it means to me. Without God, I'm not eating. This evening, I pray that Brother Spears has some food for me. But if he does have some food for me, I know it's because of God. In fact, tomorrow, I hope to go over his house to have some more food. In fact, I hope tomorrow's a food day. If tomorrow is a food day, it's going to be because of God. See, God is the determining factor. He's the one who provides. It's not our jobs. It's God who provided the jobs. It's God. Many of us know that there have been people that we've worked with that had to quit because of health reasons. If you're healthy and able to work today, praise be unto God. Years ago, a few years ago, the Mennonite church around the corner needed to use our church for a funeral. Now, I would argue the Mennonites live kind of healthy. But they had a 25-year-old member of the church who died of cancer. I'm not responsible for my health. God is. I'm not responsible for my food. God is. I'm not even responsible for the church that I pastor. It's God who needs to be responsible So we need to pray in a way that says that we are absolutely reliant on God and dependent upon God. That's the biblical concept of prayer. Years ago, I heard a missionary come to our church and say, he said this, much prayer, much power, little prayer, little power. Probably, brother, you may even know him, Ed Lorena, Philippines. He said that, maybe in the early 90s. And as I look at that, in context to what prayer is, I completely agree with that. Because a person that has much prayer is someone that's completely dependent upon God, and someone that's not praying so much is more self-reliant and self-willed than they are dependent upon God. And it's God is the reason we have power to do anything, especially in ministry, whether it's teaching Sunday school students, whether it's telling others about Jesus, whether it's being a deacon of a church, a pastor of a church, or holding any other office within the church, whether it's going to work, whether it's breathing. It's God. He's the one that's responsible. And that's what prayer should say. That's what prayer should declare. A third is we need to be consumers of God's word. Now, I'm not just talking about reading God's word. I'm not even just talking about studying God's word. If I ask you to raise your hand if you've sinned this week, I'm sure every hand would go up except the prideful hand, right? If we know we sin weekly, probably we may sin sin daily, right? Many of us, most of us, I know I do then shouldn't God's word be affecting and impacting our lives daily? 
sometimes I go through days and weeks studying, reading, forming outlines, but God just isn't changing me. I don't think it's because of God as much as it is because I've turned a deaf ear and a deaf, a deaf, deaf ear, yeah, a deaf ear and a blind eye to the truth of God's word. Why? Because I'm thinking about others more than I'm thinking about myself. I see the beam in other people's lives and the moat in my own life. We need to pray in such a way, or we need to read the Bible in such a way where God's word is constantly and continually changing our life. If we don't, then God's word does become stale. Mm, that's right. And it does become a burden. And it does become difficult. I have a problem with my diet, right? My problem is I love everything you're not supposed to like. I love carbs, I love cheese, and I love chocolate. Part of the carbs, it's the bread, right? I love bread. When my younger brother and I, he's about a year younger than me, when we were kids, we grew up in poverty, and, and whenever my mom bought bread, she usually bought four or five loaves at a time, the Kroger brand bread, right? And we, my mom worked second shift, so it's just my younger brother and I throughout our junior high and high school years. I would eat a loaf of bread in one setting. There were times when I would have a contest with my neighbors on how many slices of bread you can stick in your mouth. When I was 15 and 16, 16 slices. I'm not sure how I didn't choke other than God was good and my ignorance. But there's nothing that I would ever... Fresh bread and stale bread. We go to fresh bread all the time. I don't even like the feel of stale bread. It's hard. And sometimes it gets moldy, the color, right? Stale bread is nasty. God's word is the bread of life. And if God's word isn't changing us, then it ceases to become the bread of life. It just becomes stale bread. And it's possible that's the reason maybe that when you, if you're, if you're the one here that thinks, I don't get anything out of God's word, it may not mean that you're lost. It just may mean that you're not allowing God's word to change you. So it's become stale. There's a fourth thing we absolutely need. And honestly, with contemporary Christianity today, this is nearly tantamount to a cuss word. This phrase is, we need to fear God. Today's Christian mindset, whether it's Christian or not, isn't to fear God at all. It's not just the healthy fear that we need. We need an immediate and permanent fear of God. The Proverbs says this in Proverbs 8.13, the fear of the Lord. I love the Bible because the Bible, the Bible answers our questions. What I mean by that is this. What does it mean to fear God? You don't have to guess. Just go to God's word. God's word has the answer to that question, right? What does it mean to love God? Now, you may get a hundred different answers, but the truth is we don't have to guess, right? We can go to John 14, 15, and we know what it means to love God. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Very explicit, right? Explicit in 1 John, explicit in James, implicit in the rest of the Bible. Loving God means we will keep his commandments. So what does it mean to fear God? Fearing God, according to Proverbs 8.13, is to hate evil. And then he lists a series of evils. The very first item that comes on is pride. And just in case the prideful person doesn't get it, the second list in the, in the evil category is arrogancy. We need to fear God to the point where we turn from evil. And so let's get kind of back into the text here in Proverbs 23 for just a moment. A man's pride shall bring him low, but here's the contrast, right? The antithetical part, the good part. 
but the honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. It's interesting, right? It's the pride that trips up the prideful person. But notice, it's not the humbleness of the person that lifts up the humble person. If it was the humbleness of the person that lifts up the humble person, then his humbleness would have transitioned to pride. See, instead, it's honor. It's honor that upholds the humble in spirit. Now, this word humble speaks of something that's weighty. In fact, oftentimes in the Old Testament, this word is translated the glory of God. See, what upholds the humble, it's not the humble person, it's not their strength, it's the full weight of God that upholds the humble. It's the honor of God that upholds the humble. Why is this so absolutely critical for us Christians? It doesn't matter what kind of plans you may have for 2022. It doesn't matter what kind of ministries you may be involved in. It doesn't matter what kind of exciting new projects that the church may have. If we're not humble people, then we are not being upheld by the full weight of God, and God is just seeking an opportunity that's right for him to cause us to trip over our pride. We need to be poor and have a contrite spirit for God to do anything with us that would speak to his power and his glory. Amen. And so let me close this evening with just this thought. It's not a matter of humbleness for the sake of humbleness. Because that's pride. You know, my son-in-law said this to me when we first met. Now I'm thankful he's changed his course, and I'm thankful he still loves me after my response to him. But he says, I am honest and humble. I said, Travis, you're a liar and prideful. It took him a few years before he believed that statement. And now I see God working in him in a way that God hasn't worked in him in the past. He's become a phenomenal husband, a phenomenal father. And he loves his pastor. And he loves his church. See, it isn't just humbleness for the sake of being humble. It's humbleness for the sake of giving God the Father glory by Jesus Christ through the church that you're serving in. Amen. That's the goal of humbleness. It's for God to get the glory. It's for the, the light to be shown on God and not us. And so this evening, I'm not sure where you are. I can just tell you where I am and my struggles. And I pray that this sermon has been a help to you. And I pray that God's word, along with his spirit, will help you to make application to this sermon in the way that will redound to his glory.